Well, good evening and welcome to Vespers on this Monday of the sixth week after Pentecost. Thank you for being with me. Uh, it is good to be back with you. Trust me. <laughs> I'm so glad to be out of my recliner. Uh, it's good to be back um, to something like a routine. I've not quite 100% yet, but I'm definitely on the mend, and I thank everybody for your prayers. So what are we doing tonight? Tonight, we are... Uh, we're doing the Vespers Liturgy. Uh, the lessons we have are Psalm 112, and we have finished the Books of Wisdom. So now if you're keeping up, we're in Numbers, and tonight we begin Numbers chapter 16. We've also moved into Romans as our New Testament reading. So we're in Romans chapter 3, and we're going to catch the second half of chapter 3 and finish that. So let's begin with a word of prayer. Would you please pray with me? O everlasting God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, grant us your grace that we may study the Holy Scriptures diligently and with our whole heart seek and find Christ therein, and through him obtain everlasting life. Through the same Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Jesus Christ is the light of the world, the light no darkness can overcome. Stay with us, Lord, for it is evening, and the day is almost over. Let your light scatter the darkness and illumine your church. Joyous light of glory of the immortal Father, heavenly, holy, blessed Jesus Christ, we have come to the setting of the sun, and we look to the evening light. We sing to God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You are worthy of being praised with pure voices forever. O Son of God, O giver of life, the universe proclaims your glory. The Lord be with you. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who led your people Israel by a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. Enlighten our darkness by the light of your Christ. May his word be a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. For you are merciful, and you love your whole creation. And we, your creatures, glorify you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Let my prayer rise before you as incense, the lifting up of my hands as the evening sacrifice. O Lord, I call to you. Come to me quickly. Hear my voice when I cry to you. Let my prayer rise before you as incense, the lifting up of my hands as the evening sacrifice. Set a watch before my mouth, O Lord, and guard the door of my lips. Let not my heart incline to any evil thing. Let me not be occupied in wickedness with evildoers. But my eyes are turned to you, Lord God. In you I take refuge. Strip me not of my life. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Let my prayer rise before you as incense, the lifting up of my hands as the evening sacrifice. Let the incense of our repentant prayer ascend before you, O Lord, and let your loving kindness descend upon us, that with purified minds we may sing your praises with the church on earth and the whole heavenly host, and may glorify you forever and ever. Amen. Okay. All right. Our psalm is number 112. Hallelujah. Happy are they who fear the Lord and have great delight in his commandments. Their descendants will be mighty in the land. The generation of the upright will be blessed. Wealth and riches will be in their house, and their righteousness will last forever. Light shines in the darkness for the upright. The righteous are merciful and full of compassion. It is good for them to be generous in lending and to manage their affairs with justice. 
for they will never be shaken. The righteous will be kept in everlasting remembrance. They will not be afraid of any evil rumors. Their heart is right. They put their trust in the Lord. Their heart is established and will not shrink until they see their desire upon their enemies. They have given freely to the poor, and their righteousness stands fast forever. They will hold up their head with honor. The wicked will see it and be angry. They will gnash their teeth and pine away. The desires of the wicked will perish. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, you are the light shining in the darkness for the upright. Teach us to love one another as you love us, that we might bring peace and joy to the world and find the happiness of your home, where you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit now and forever. Amen. The first reading is from Numbers chapter 16. We'll read verses 1 through 19. Now Korah, the son of Isar, son of Kohath, son of Levi, and Dathan and Abiram, the sons of Eliab, and On, the son of Peleth, sons of Reuben, took men. And they rose up before Moses with a number of the people of Israel, 250 chiefs of the congregation, chosen from the assembly, well-known men. They assembled themselves together against Moses and against Aaron, and said to them, You have gone too far. For all in the congregation are holy, every one of them, and the Lord is among them. Why then do you exalt yourselves above the assembly of the Lord? When Moses heard it, he fell on his face, and he said to Korah and all his company, In the morning the Lord will show who is his, and who is holy, and will bring him near to him. The one whom he chooses he will bring near to him. Do this. Take censers, Korah and all his company, put fire in them and put incense on them before the Lord tomorrow. And the man whom the Lord chooses shall be the Holy One. You have gone too far, sons of Levi. And Moses said to Korah, Hear now, you sons of Levi. Is it too small a thing for you that the God of Israel has separated you from the congregation of Israel? to bring you near to himself, to do service in the tabernacle of the Lord, and to stand before the congregation to minister to them, and that he has brought you near him, and all your brothers, the sons of Levi, with you. And would you seek the priesthood also? Therefore, it is against the Lord that you and all your company have gathered together. What is Aaron that you grumble against him? Sorry. And Moses sent to call Dathan and Abiram, the sons of Eliab. And they said, We will not come up. Is it a small thing that you have brought us up out of a land flowing with milk and honey to kill us in the wilderness, that you must also make yourself a prince over us? Moreover, you have not brought us into a land flowing with milk and honey, nor given us inheritance of fields and vineyards. Will you put out the eyes of these men? We will not come up. And Moses was very angry and said to the Lord, Do not respect their offering. I have not taken one donkey from them, and I have not harmed one of them. And Moses said to Korah, Be present, you and all your company, before the Lord, you and they, and Aaron, tomorrow. And let every one of you take his censer and put incense on it, and every one of you bring before the Lord his censer, two hundred and fifty censers, you also, and Aaron, each, his censer. So every man took his censer, and put fire in them, and laid incense on them, and stood at the entrance of the tent of meeting with Moses and Aaron. Then Korah assembled all the congregation against them at the entrance of the tent of meeting, and the glory of the Lord appeared to all the congregation. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Okay, so... We are well into uh, the wandering of God's people in the wilderness, okay? I think we pretty well know that. Moses is still alive, right? We know that Moses 
does not make it all the way to reach the Holy Land. He sees it, but he's not allowed, God forbids him, to go into it. So Moses is still here. He's still alive. My study Bible says we think this happened sometime later during their 38 years of wandering. We don't know exactly when. Um, and in chapters 16 and 17, we have two different groups of people coming together to, so we have sons of Levi and sons of Reuben who have joined hands to overthrow the divinely established order. And they each have a different complaint. Okay. So Reuben was the firstborn son of Jacob. And as we know, in that culture, the firstborn son is entitled to most of the inheritance, most of the authority, but that's not who that tribe did not get that level of authority. It went to the sons of Levi. Right? So they are, um, the sons of Reuben are upset about that. The, the sons of Levi, though, Korah and Dathan and Abiram, nope, sorry, Korah and his followers, Dathan, Abiram, and On are sons of Reuben. So Korah is son of Levi. Um, he is a Levite, which is not a priest, but does have... Um, um, duties in the tabernacle right so every male in the tribe of levi is a levite by birth and has those duties now right now it's just aaron and his immediate family who are priests so aaron was nominated as the first priest he became the first high priest and it is his sons and their immediate family who become the first priests of israel um, which have a bit more uh, authority than the Levites do. But the Levites are still elevated above the rest of the the nation of Israel, above all the other tribes, except as far as worship and, um, and the duties that they have been given, uh, what their responsibilities are and what their authority is. They are set apart from everyone else for holy responsibility, right? Um, they have the distinction to do service in the tabernacle of the Lord, but they presume to seek the priesthood also, so that what they were given was not good enough, okay? But they think that Moses and Aaron, his brother, are um, seeking power for themselves, okay? So the first response Moses has is he falls on his face, right? Moses heard it and he fell on his face. This is an act of humility, right? Um, yesterday in Lamentations, uh, Jeremiah talks about he put his face in the dust, right? It is an act of humility to lower yourself lower than the person in front of you. For Jeremiah, it was God. Moses here, He's standing facing Korah and 250 chiefs of the people. It would not take much for them to kill him. And they've already grumbled against him many times at this point. We saw it in Massa and Meribah, you know, the, oh, we're going to, you know, you freed us from slavery and now you're going to starve us and we're going to die out here in the wilderness. We don't have any water to drink, you know, all this complaining. They're just, they're constantly complaining. It's never good enough. And Moses, every time this happens, he says the same thing. Look, it's not me. I'm not, th this was not my choice. I did not bring us here. I am acting on God's behalf. This is God's will for us to come here, to be in this place at this time, to follow this path, to do these things. And he, that's what he says here. He fell on his face and right away. He says, in the morning, the Lord will show who is his and who is holy and will bring him near to him, right? Who is God's chosen leader for this people, right? This is in the day before God allowed them to have a human king. God wanted to be their king. Moses was not their king. He merely spoke 
on God's behalf to the people. In fact, Moses wasn't seeking to do that. He didn't want the job. If you remember, Moses told God, I am not the right person for this. I'm not the, I'm not a good man to do this. I'm not able to speak well. The, the, the way the Hebrew is written there, it tells us we think Moses had some kind of a speech impediment. Was it a stutter? Was it a lisp? We don't know. But he was not able to speak well. And God said, well, you're my guy. So I will tell you, you share it with Aaron and Aaron can tell the people. <laughs> God wanted Moses to be his prophet. Now, Moses is more than a prophet. He is, um, by the strict definition of the word, he is a Messiah. He is an anointed one, a, a one set apart for a special purpose in God's plan. He is a leader of his people, but not a king. Nor is he a priest. That's Aaron. Aaron has the priestly duties. Moses is more like prophet but also judge. So it's a, more than a prophet, more than merely a judge, right? So, and these people think, Korah and the other people, well, why does Moses get to do this? Because God chose him. Right? So Moses comes right back. Well, you know, hey, Moses, you've gone too far. Everybody in this congregation is holy. This, and this is the whole nation, Israel, okay? All 12 tribes, everybody's holy, every one of them. Well, we know that's not true. Many of them are rebellious. Many of them are sinful, turn their backs on the Lord, worship false gods. We've seen this already up, up coming up to numbers. You know, you look right. Moses went up on the mountain to get the Ten Commandments. And by the time he came back down, the people were already, they had made a bronze statue and or a golden statue, excuse me, the golden bull, and were worshiping it. This is the God who brought us out of Egypt smash the Ten Commandments, you know. So this is not true. But, you know, he's saying, why do you, this is you and you, Moses, and your brother Aaron, why do you exalt yourselves above the assembly of the Lord? Why do you think you two are better than everybody else? Moses did not pick this role for himself or for his brother. This was God's doing. Moses was called by God from the burning bush. God sought out Moses. Moses did not seek this for himself. So he said, well, in the morning, the Lord will show who is his, who is holy, and he will bring that man near to him. God will make it clear. The one whom he chooses, he will bring near to him. Right? So take your censers. Right? Now, what's a censer? A censer is the thing that they burned incense with. I, I don't know exactly what um, what they what they looked like back then. There's a little um definition here in this in the logos bible it says uh fire pan one of the vessels of the temple service right censers and incense were used in worship you know we just did vespers right let my prayer rise before you as incense this is a very ancient tradition that prayer and smoke from incense is all kind of it sets the mood we want our prayers to be fragrant to god to be a, a good odor in God's nostrils, right? That's the 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 idea that we're given by these ancient prayers, okay? So the priests would use censers to make sure that the holy space, the worship space, had a good scent to it, and they used incense for that. So each priest, or wannabe priest in this case, had their own censer. So Moses is telling them, all of you, bring your censers. Put fire in them and put incense on top of that, which is how they work. The fire went, the coals went underneath and the incense went on top of the coals. Put incense on them before the Lord tomorrow. In other words, at the tent of meeting. If you wanted to be in God's presence, you went to the tent of meeting. It was a mobile version of what became the temple that Solomon built. In this case, it was mobile, so it could be with the people while they were while they were sojourning. Um, the man whom the Lord chooses shall be the Holy One. You sons of Levi, are the ones who have gone too far, right? You have already been given so much, and you want more than what God gave you. Here now, you sons of Levi, is it too small a thing for you that the God of Israel has separated you from the congregation of Israel, made, elevated you above the average Israelite? God has already made you special among Israelites, and that's not enough for you. You want more. To, 
He has brought you near to himself. They're Levites. They can be closer to the Ark of the Covenant than the average Jew. The only ones who have more access to the tabernacle than the Levites are Aaron and his brothers. Why would you not appreciate what God has already given you? You have been called to do service in the tabernacle of the Lord. Not every Jew can say that. Not every Israelite can say that. To stand before the congregation to minister to them. You are an agent of God. That's not enough for you. He has already brought you near him and all your brothers, the sons of Levi with you. Everyone in that tribe, every man in that tribe has this responsibility, this duty, and this authority. And that's not enough. You would seek the priesthood also? You want to tell God who you think you should be when God has already set this up? Therefore, it is against the Lord that you and all your company have gathered together. What is Aaron that you grumble against him? Aaron didn't ask for this. God ordained it, just as God ordained Moses to be his prophet, his spokesperson. So he's making sure he's like, look, if you want to be mad, don't be mad at me. I didn't ask for this. You got to be mad at God because this is what God instructed. This is how things were supposed to be. If you don't like it, it's not against me that you are angry. So then Moses, that's so that takes care of the sons of Levi. Now you have the sons of Reuben, right? Moses sent to call Dathan and Abiram, sons of Eliab. We're not coming. Is it a small thing that you have brought us up out of a land flowing with milk and honey? Now here they're talking about Egypt, okay? Egypt was plenty of food. Yeah, life was not great. But they did they never went hungry the way it's written. You brought us up out of a plentiful land where we had plenty of food and water. Now you're gonna kill us in the wilderness. And now but in addition to that, you're also gonna make yourself a prince over us. Moses never said that. This is them interpreting the situation in their own way to get their point across. On top of that. You've not brought us into a land flowing with milk and honey, which is what was promised to Abraham, nor given us inheritance of fields and vineyards, which was promised according to the promise to Abraham, right? You're going to move into a great land with plenty of yield. If we were to do crops, you're going to, our inheritance is supposed to be plots of land that we could plant and grow crops in, fields and vineyards. Will you put out the eyes of these men? What that means is, this is what we see. Are you going to blind us and make us pretend that we don't see what we actually see? Because this is what we see. No, we're not coming up because you have power over us and we expect you to punish us somehow because we've spoken out against you. So Moses was very angry and said to the Lord, do not respect their offering. Okay, this is a reference back to here. Come to the tent of meeting tomorrow with your censors and God will pick who he wants to be his spokesperson his spokesman and moses is saying don't let it be these men these ones who won't even come up and face me in person i haven't moses is saying i haven't taken one donkey from them so i haven't abused my authority and i've not harmed any of them and we know moses was a murderer he killed a guy and he killed an egyptian who was beating a, a, Jew, a hebrew but um since he went to work for the lord that has not been his practice. He has been trying to save the people and do God's will. But don't let one of them be the one that you select, right? <laughs> don't be one of these, Dathan or Byram or own one of these sons of Reuben that you bring near to yourself. Okay. So Moses, now he goes back to Korah. He repeats his instruction. Be present. You and all your company before the Lord, that means at the tent of meeting, that's where God's presence is, you and they, and Aaron too. So you, Korah, and the other 250, and Aaron also, who is the one that you're grumbling against, and this will be tomorrow, and let every single one of you, all 252, the 250 plus Korah plus Aaron, take your censer, put incense in it, bring it before the Lord. You, you, Korah, and Aaron, each one have your censer. 
bring it to the tent of meeting. And so they did. And they put fire in them and put incense on the fire and stood at the entrance of the tent of meeting with Moses and Aaron. And Korah assembled all the congregation against Moses and Aaron at the tent of the entrance of the tent of meeting, which is where you went when you wanted to be in Lord's, the Lord's presence. And there were rules for worship when you were supposed to go there. So they're going to ask God to pick who was to be his spokesman to lead the people on God's behalf. So they're all gathered there with their censers. And the glory of the Lord appeared to the whole country so they could all see God's glory. Now, what did that look like? It's in the morning, right? So, so every man took his censer. Yeah. So they did it. <clears throat> so my guess is, since it was probably daylight, it was probably a pillar of cloud. May have been a pillar of fire, but earlier it was a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. So that's probably what it was. But it was clearly God's presence. And it's and appeared to all of them. So we'll find out tomorrow what happens after that. So let's move on to the New Testament. All right, Romans 3. And you know, you see the part that I have highlighted there because I repeat it frequently. But let's, let's read this and then we'll talk about it a little bit. <clears throat> but now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law. Although the law and the prophets bear witness to it, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance he had passed over former sins. It was to show his righteousness at the present time so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Then what becomes of our boasting? It is excluded. By what kind of law? By a law of works? No, but by the law of faith. For we hold that one is justified by faith apart from works of the law. Or is God the God of Jews only? Is he not the God of Gentiles also? Yes, of Gentiles also. Since God is one, who will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through faith? Do we then overthrow the law by this faith? By no means. On the contrary, we uphold the law. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. <clears throat> okay. Um, so, the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law. Now, how has the righteousness of God been manifested? Um, all right. The righteousness of God is Christ, right? Christ is God's righteousness personified. Okay. It's been manifested apart from the law. Okay. His sacrifice on the cross fulfills the Old Testament law. Okay. Jesus said, I did not come to abolish the law, but to fulfill it. Right. All the sin requires a sacrifice and that we know that because even the most righteous jew like that all have sinned so everybody had to do this the only jew who didn't was jesus all have sinned and fall short of the glory of god so they had to every year go to atone for their sins by offering a sacrifice of an animal as the law prescribed that's how they were to make themselves righteous once more by atoning for their sins but this has been manifested apart from them, right? Although the law and the prophets bear witness to it, right? That that means the whole Old Testament, the laws, the first five books, the prophets are the rest of the of the of the scriptures for the Old Testament. They talk about this, they point towards the Messiah, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus for all who believe. So we receive God's righteousness because our own righteousness is not enough. We receive that through faith in Christ, and, and that is for all who believe in him, right? Why are you going to have faith if you don't believe in him, right? It's, it's kind of redundant, but you get the point. But there's no distinction. No one, not Jew nor Gentile, and that's that covers everybody. You're either a Jew or a non-Jew, which means Gentile, okay? There is no distinction. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. 
no one is as righteous as God and no one is righteous as righteous enough for God on their own. So, but we are justified by God's grace as a gift, right? We can't earn it. We can't work for it. How do we get it? Through the redemption that is in Christ. That's his sacrifice on the cross. He did that for us. That's where we get justification. God put him forward as a propitiation by his blood. Jesus' blood takes the place of the animal blood that used to be offered as atonement sacrifice, as propitiation. That's atonement sacrifice. The sacrifice that pays the price for sin. Okay? Right? God did that. Sorry. God did this. He put Jesus forward to pay the price for sin using Jesus' own blood. That's the gift. That's where we get the justification by grace. God did it not because we earned it, but because he loves us and doesn't want us to be condemned eternally. He wants us to be saved. To do that, he sent his son who redeemed us by his blood, paid the price for our sin. And it is a gift and we receive it by faith. Remember Pastor Dave's saying, what's the first thing faith says? It's thank you. That's how you receive a gift. Thank you. This was to show God's righteousness. Okay? Not ours. Ours is not enough. It's God's righteousness. In his divine forbearance, he had passed over former sins. Okay, what does this mean? He postponed the punishment for the sins of those who died before Christ's birth, or rather I should say before Christ's crucifixion, because the propitiation hadn't been made yet, his blood hadn't been shed yet, so he postponed the punishment so this could take place and the price could be paid. He passed over former sins. He doesn't ignore sins ever, but the price is paid by his son's blood to show his righteousness. He's righteous, which means he does not ignore sin. A righteous God and a just God, so that he might be just, does not ignore sin, can't ignore sin, it was to show his righteousness at the present time so that he might be just, doesn't ignore sin, it has to be punished, but he's also the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. The one who has faith in Jesus is justified by the gift. Okay, I know that's a lot of circular talk there, but he, he is explaining it step by step. And he's reinforcing the important phrases. So, so what becomes of our boasting? We don't boast. We have nothing to boast about. We cannot earn this. We can't do it through works of the law, right? Boasting is excluded. Can't do it. What kind of law? Law of works? That doesn't, that doesn't do us any good anymore. The law and working towards fulfilling it does not get us anywhere because we're not righteous enough. We can't keep the law enough because all have sinned and we will continue to. No, what's going on here is the law of faith. Okay, the law of faith. <sighs> law of faith, it is being saved by grace. That's the law of faith, right? We are justified by his grace as a gift. That's the law of faith. We hold that, the, that one is justified by faith apart from works of the law. It has nothing to do with how hard you try to uphold the law. Your, your justification is not achieved by anything you do. Is God the God of the Jews only? Of course not. They were the ones that they believed righteous living achieved your salvation. Those are works of the law. Is God not the God of Gentiles also? Yes. Right? The Jews' first work of the law is to be circumcised. Right? Many of them thought, well, I'm circumcised. I'm saved. No. no. Right? God is also the God of the uncircumcised. Gentiles also, since God is one. And that's a little throwback to the Shema, that very important prayer. Hear, O Israel, the Lord. Hear the Lord, O Israel, the Lord is one right? The, this God will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through faith. The study Bible here says, don't get caught up in those prepositions. It's not that big a deal. Faith is how that justification will come to both, okay? It is to be received by faith. 
Do we overthrow the law by this faith? No. Jesus said, I didn't come to abolish the law. I came to fulfill it. By no means. This is that, oh, heck no. And it's much stronger than heck, right? On the contrary, we uphold the law. When we are saved, we keep God's law. That is our way, or we, we try. We uphold it. We respect it. I'm not throwing it away, saying it's useless, because that's not the case either. All right, we'll continue that tomorrow. Let's conclude our liturgy. In many and various ways, God spoke to his people of old by the prophets. But now in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son. My soul proclaims the greatness of the Lord. My spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. For he has looked with favor on his lowly servant. From this day, all generations will call me blessed. The Almighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name. He has mercy on those who fear him in every generation. He has shown the strength of his arm. He has scattered the proud in their conceit. He has cast down the mighty from their thrones and has lifted up the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things and the rich he has sent away empty. He has come to the help of his servant Israel, for he has remembered his promise of mercy, the promise he made to our fathers, to Abraham and his children forever. Glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For this holy gathering and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For Dan, our bishop, for Steve, our dean, for your servant, for Pastor Henry, Pastor Nelson, Vicar Rebecca, for all our pastors in Christ, for all servants of the church, and for all the people, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For our public servants, for the government and those who protect us, that they may be upheld and strengthened in every good deed, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For those who work to bring peace, justice, health, and protection in this and every place, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For those who bring offerings, those who do good works in their congregation, those who toil, those who sing, and all the people here present who await from the Lord great and abundant mercy, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For favorable weather, for an abundance of the fruits of the earth and for peaceful times, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For our deliverance from all affliction, wrath, danger, and need, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the faithful who have gone before us and are at rest, let us give thanks to the Lord. Alleluia. Help save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Rejoicing in the fellowship of all the saints, let us commend ourselves, one another, and our whole life to Christ our Lord, to you, O Lord. O God, from whom come all holy desires, all good counsels, and all just works, give to us, your servants, that peace which the world cannot give, that our hearts may be set to obey your commandments, and also that we, being defended from the fear of our enemies, may live in peace and quietness through the merits of Jesus Christ, our Savior, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, God forever. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. 
Now the almighty and merciful Lord, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit bless and preserve you. Amen. All right, that concludes our Vespers for this Monday. Thank you for spending this time in the Word with me, and thank you for giving back to God a little bit of the day He's given to you. Uh, I'm going to try and uh, get back on schedule this week. So uh, I'm in the office. Um, I don't know that I'll be able to work as long as I had been working. I, I do need to elevate my leg a good bit. And, um, but I'm going to try and get back to these. So we're going to try and do Vespers tomorrow night and Matins the rest of the week, except Thursday. Uh, the office is closed that day to celebrate the independence of our country. And I think that's important. So I'll post the readings Thursday, but the rest of the week we should have devotional videos. So I hope you can join me for at least some of those. So uh, thank you for your prayers. I know some of you have been praying for me and I've I've heard about that and I appreciate all of that. I will take all the prayers I can get. Rest assured, I get a little better each day and the pain is really not that bad. So uh, thank you for your love and, and prayers and I appreciate it. So again, thank you for being here. I wish you a blessed rest of your Monday. And until we can be together again, whenever that is, may God bless and keep you.